We welcome the Most Reverend Daniel E. Thomas, Bishop of the Diocese of Toledo, and inquire uh, during this uh, tumultuous time, what's happening uh, on your calendar, on your schedule? Well, Ron, one of the first things I wanted to mention is we're doing these tapings, dear folks, at a time when we have only now learned that the governor is asking us to remain at home. So these tapings have happened even before that happened. I just want to make that clear to folks. And also to make clear to folks, they always, I'm always grateful when people are interested in what activities are happening around the diocese and where I'll be. Obviously, I can't be at Fish Fries these days because of the restrictions. And I hope you know all these confirmations that we had planned, for example, parish events, events that I was going to be present for. Hope you understand, everyone, given the current situation, these have been either postponed or canceled. So we have to be abiding by the guidelines. We have to be conscious that health comes first. We do not want to be the cause of anyone becoming ill, and we want to care for others who are. So that's where we are at this moment. We're just glad to be with you on the radio and virtually today. Absolutely. We know that these are uh, troubled times, and uh, this pandemic is a serious one, and uh, it's all uncharted waters, uh, really, for us. So, so we, we, we navigate the waters together. In, you've heard me say it before, folks, in the bark of Peter, which we call the boat, which is the church herself. So we're together, rowing in the same direction, and doing our very best to remain close to the Lord and to one another. Mm -hmm. Please, Ron, do you want to do the gospel for us, yeah, as we always uh, do? Let's do a recent gospel from the fifth Sunday of Lent. Thank you. The sisters of Lazarus sent word to Jesus, saying, Master, the one you love is ill. When Jesus heard this, he said, This illness is not to end in death, but it is for the glory of God, so that, that the Son of God may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he remained for two days in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus, Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went to meet him, but Mary sat at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise. Martha said, I know he will rise in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus told her, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, even if he dies, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord. I have come to believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who is coming into the world. He became perturbed and deeply troubled and said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Sir, come and see. And Jesus wept. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind man have done something so that this man would not have died? So Jesus perturbed again, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone lay across it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the dead man's sister, said to him, Lord, by now there will be a stench, for he has been dead for four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus raised his eyes and said, Father, I thank you for hearing me. I know that you always hear me, but because of the crowd here, I have said this, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, he cried out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, tied hand and foot with burial bands, and his face was wrapped in a cloth. So Jesus said to them, Untie him and let him go. Now many of the Jews who had come to Mary had seen what he had done, began to believe in him. Your thoughts, Bishop? Folks, what a powerful gospel to hear any time, but in a particular way in Lent, and most especially at this time when we are confronted by such a crisis of illness of the coronavirus. We know we hear 
very, very much the words to Jesus, Master, the one you love is ill. I can only imagine that all of us lifting up all the people who are ill right now are saying to Jesus, Master, the ones you love are ill. And I can also only imagine, dear folks, that if there are people who have died and who will die in this crisis, we can only imagine that just as Jesus wept for Lazarus, so he weeps for their deaths as a result of this illness. But that's not the end of the story, because this gospel of Lazarus's being raised from the dead comes in the Lenten time leading up to the resurrection. In some ways, it's a prefigurement, isn't it? Lazarus spent time in the tomb. He's raised by Jesus. Jesus himself will spend time in the tomb and will be raised by the power of the Father and the Holy Spirit. So we hear the question that's posed to Martha. And it sense, folks, it's a pet question posed to us today, isn't it? In fact, he asks, do you believe this? And she responds, yes, Lord. I've come to believe you are the Christ, the Son of God, the one who's coming into the world. Folks, if we ask ourselves this question, and these are days when we ask hard questions, aren't they, of ourselves? And really, Jesus is asking, do you believe this? Do you believe that he is the resurrection and the life, and whoever believes in him, even if he dies, will never die because he will have eternal life? This is the question posed to Martha and the question posed to us. With Martha, folks, let's say, yes, Lord, I do believe. And let's trust that he has the power to raise us in the end to himself. Thank you. Comforting words during these uh, troubling times. And, and Bishop, with that in mind, uh, let's let's go to a question that really relates to this pa current pandemic situation. I know we have a few in this regard, Ron. Please yes, do. we do. Uh, a lot of folks are, are very concerned. And uh, Susan in Toledo writes, Dear Bishop, did you ever think you would live in a time when churches would be closed and our Lord would be alone in the Adoration Chapel waiting for us to give glory to him? Please share your reflection. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Susan. Even in your question, I can feel your pain at that of, of your feeling the absence of these possibilities for us. And Susan, I feel that with you. I, perhaps I feel it more than anyone. Nevertheless, I'm able to receive the Eucharist, I realize. But remember, as I receive the Eucharist at Mass, I'm receiving it for all of you as I celebrate Holy Eucharist. Who could have imagined this? I've heard it over and over again, Susan. No one in our lifetime would have been able to imagine seeing something like this. But I think it's important to just mention one thing. And Someone said, Susan, to me, and I think it's, it's critical, I'm sure you've heard the, pra the phrase, when people are denied something, they want it all the more. Have you ever heard that phrase? Yeah. Sometimes it's because of one reason or another. And, you know, when people are denied alcohol, they want it all the more. When children are denied this thing, you know, some candy, they want it all the more. But now it's, it's radically serious because in some sense, we're all denied the coming together to worship in the Holy Eucharist at Mass and to celebrate Mass and receive Holy Communion. And as a result... We desire it all the more. I hope, Susan, that the result of this is a great deepening of Eucharistic faith. I hope the result of this is Pope, people coming back to Mass, people realizing the deep value, those who already love the Lord, deepening Eucharistic faith and piety, recognizing His presence in the sacrament and in our neighbor. I hope it's going to draw people back to the church who have fallen away, and I hope it's going to bring people to the Catholic faith and belief in the Eucharist who perhaps do not yet believe. So I think, Susan, is it painful? Of course it is. I hope it's going to be an extraordinary moment for greater grace in the church around our Eucharistic faith. Mm. Beautiful. Thank you very much uh, for that question. Uh, let's uh, get one more question in before we go to break, Bishop. Uh, Thank this you. This one is from Sammy in Swanton. 
who asked, Dear Bishop Thomas, which prayer do you say during tumultuous times? Thank you, Sammy. I don't say enough prayers in these tumultuous times, but I hope, Sammy, you recognize from Swanton, as all of our brothers and sisters throughout the diocese and indeed the country and the whole world, all of our prayer has been ramped up, I hope, during these critical times. And I hope you know, Sammy, I asked people especially to enter into those three pillars of Lent, and that is to ramp up particular intensified prayer, fasting, and almsgiving in these times. And Sammy, the one way I asked was that we would pray at least weekly the Stations of the Cross and to make that prayer our own at least up and through through Easter time. So to that end, I can share with you all that we will have the Stations of the Cross, which is being recorded from our cathedral, and they'll be available on our diocesan website. I'm going to pray a Stations of the Cross in our cathedral church so that all of our people from throughout the 19 counties can unite with me in praying that prayer in the face of this crisis. And I know many of our parishes are actually broadcasting live streaming stations on Friday evening, and they're up on their websites too to pray with their parish. So I hope, Susan, uh, Sammy, that that's helpful, and I hope you'll join me in praying the Stations of the Cross during this time. Very good. We need it more than ever. Uh, Bishop, we're going to take a little bit of a break. Uh, we are going to uh, return with more questions here on the Bishop's Corner. With Thank you, Ron. Ron. Stay tuned, everyone. Thank you to Rieger's Church Supplies and Religious Gifts, the official sponsor of the Bishop's Corner videos. Rieger's is located at 4100 Secor Road in Toledo. Call 419-474-4740 or visit on the web at Rieger's.com. Welcome back to the Bishop's Corner here on Annunciation Radio. Bishop Daniel Thomas, always here. and We're so glad you're with, you're with us, folks, by either video or by radio. Thank you for joining us. Always eager to answer your questions and uh, looking for those, too. We're checking the uh, emails uh, daily. Uh, you can email your questions to bishop at annunciationradio.com or use the quick form on the uh, Annunciation Radio app. Uh, we do... Uh, ask that you do include at least your first name and your parish or town that you're from. So Bishop Thomas uh, kind of has some idea who he's talking to. Uh, so uh, we get to as many questions as we can as time allows. So keep listening for Bishop Thomas to answer yours here on the Bishop's Corner. And Ron, just to reiterate, folks, we are social distancing. We're also feeling the absence of Ron Miller, who cannot be here as a result of attending to things regarding the coronavirus outbreak. And that means, too, we are feeling our missing someone, mm -hmm. even on this radio show. I just want to say we're uniting with all of you, dear folks, because we know that given the situation, you're missing many of your loved ones. You're missing the regularities of daily life. So we we're all in this moment together, and even though we are missing people, I just want to reemphasize how we are united in the communion of prayer, because that communion allows us to miss no one by bringing them before the Lord. Thank you. So and we're, I think we have a few more questions about important. the coronavirus, Ron. Well, and uh, our next question uh, comes from Braden on social media, who simply asks this oh, question. Oh, yes. Thank you. What's the hardest thing about being a bishop? <laughs> so, Braden, uh, not to trivialize it, but I must say, imagine the hardest thing about being a bishop right now is being a bishop during the coronavirus mm -hmm. pandemic. Who could imagine that any of us would be in this? And I think it's hard for me, and it's hard for every one of you. And I, I have to say, that, you know, the regular life of a bishop and the pastoral care that he takes of his flock is usually busy enough. But one of the hardest things I must confess to you, Braden, is being separated physically from my flock. I think you know me well enough. I love to be with my people. And so to be separated from the people, not to be able to be able to offer mass publicly and be at different events and parishes. And just like all our priests, this is a very painful time. I, I read a beautiful article recently. Actually, it's by a priest who's a former spiritual directee of mine. It appeared on The Catholic Thing on social media. And his name is Father Paul Scalia, a priest of Arlington, Virginia. And he talks about the tremendous 
difficult feeling of every priest being separated from his people. And so I think if I had to say anything, Braden, that's what I would say first, the most difficult thing right now, just like you are being challenged, being separated from loved ones and colleagues, it's being separated from people. That's the hardest thing right now. And it, we got to remember to pray for our priests and to pray for our bishop and our pope, uh, especially during this time, because we feel that separation. Uh, even though uh, there's there's constant uh, flow of information, we still feel connected to you, our bishop, and to the diocese. And I think that's, you know, when you talk about the hardest thing to do when you're a bishop, it, it, you know, to do all these things despite these times to still maintain some connectedness. And I think these are necessary things so that people understand that we have not abandoned them, that we are with them, that we care for them, that we stand with them, and that together we're going to move through this prayerfully. And uh, Bishop, let's move to a question. Uh, this comes from uh, Joanne uh, from Toledo, who uh, has has a related question about the uh, the suspension of public masses. Yes. The question is, will there still be a chrism mass? Thank you, Joanne. A very thoughtful question. Of course, as as the bishops of Ohio have all indicated, through and up to Easter Sunday, there would be no public mass. But your question is an excellent one because the chrism mass is a mass that takes place every year in Holy Week, and it's that mass which really is the singular moment where the entire diocese is, if you will, uh, represented because it's bishop, priests, deacons, consecrated religious, seminarians, and lay faithful from all of our 19 counties and all our parishes. The reality is the Chrism Mass, it's possible to postpone that. We have the permission to do it. But in fact, Joanne, I am going to celebrate a Chrism Mass during Holy Week, probably on the same day that it was scheduled for, but of course, privately and in our cathedral chapel. And I do that also because the reality is those oils are consecrated and the sacred chrism oils are blessed and sacred chrism consecrated for use among our priests and deacons and faithful for the sacraments. I do not want the oils not to be refreshed and newly blessed and consecrated. So I will offer the chrism mass probably Tuesday of Holy Week, and we will keep you updated in that regard. And it will likely be live streamed or at least taped. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for that question, Joanne. Um, let's go to uh, Amy on social media who writes, Dear Bishop, if the Triduum are the holiest days of the year, why aren't they holy days of obligation? Thank you, Amy. So we all know, folks, uh, first of all, you may or may not know what the Triduum is. So Amy is very liturgically adept and well-informed because the Triduum comes simply from the word from Latin, which simply means three. And of course, the Triduum is the three most sacred days of the church's year. That is Holy Thursday, Good Friday, and Holy Saturday. That's the celebration of the Triduum. It's often actually understood to be one celebration, one moment, if you will, liturgically. So the reality is in the United States, there are six holy days, the Ascension, the Assumption, All Saints, Immaculate Conception, and Christmas. So no church document, Amy, actually says, discusses why a date is not a holy day, but I think we should say that one of the things we should point out is that Easter Sunday is a holy day of obligation because every Sunday is a holy day of obligation. And the reality is that Easter Sunday, of course, the Easter Vigil is part of Easter Sunday. So that's already a holy day of obligation. The others, of course, uh, someone might say, well, three consecutive days of holy days might be too burdensome to impose upon people. But I think we also have to say that the time for each day of the mystery of the Triduum being celebrated, it, it all is caught up into the one mystery. So Thursday evening, Mass of the Lord's Supper, Friday afternoon, the Liturgy of Good Friday, and then the Vigil of Easter. So I hope in some way that's helpful in answering, but there's no doubt, Amy, and thank you for being so astute. The Triduum is certainly the three most sacred days. Why? Because of the celebration of the Last Supper, 
of the crucifixion and death of Jesus and of the resurrection of the Lord. Thank you. Very good. Thank you very much for that question, Amy. Uh, let's move on to Pat, uh, who we don't know the location, don't know the parish or the town, but uh, Pat writes, Dear Bishop Thomas, does the diocese give information about or encourage the use of health care sharing plans in lieu of using insurance uh, that do not align with our Catholic beliefs, such as uh, praying, uh, paying for sterilizations, etc. Is there information available, uh, or could someone come to parishes to talk about this? Um, I did use Samaritan Ministries, but now use Solidarity. Uh, there are other plans, such as MediShare, and probably others as well. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. So we just want to be clear, too, in this time of coronavirus outbreak, we're talking here about health care sharing plans, not simply access to health care. I think that's an important note for us here. And certainly as a self-funded plan for the diocese, we're able to exclude, Pat, any services not in line with Catholic teaching. So that's important in our own health care plans. In regard, though, to this question of sharing health care plans, we don't provide information as that because parishioners make independent decisions about their choice for health care. And it's important to clarify health care sharing plans are not the same thing as health insurance. So we just want to make that distinction for our listeners and make sure that they understand. The USCCB in a 2017 letter to the Senate on health care reform noted, no health care reform plan should compel us or others to pay for the destruction of human life and should also, quote, honor conscience rights for those who participate in any way. It also noted the Catholic Church remains committed to ensuring the fundamental right to medical care, a right which is in keeping with the God-given dignity of every person and corresponding obligation as a country to provide for this right. So Pat, we would encourage anyone who's considering the use of a healthcare sharing plan to very be very very careful to review the faith statement of such a health sharing plan and to be sure it fully conforms with Catholic social teaching. Thanks, Pat, for that question. Very good. Thank you, Bishop, and uh, thank you, Pat. And, Bishop, we are out of time. Um, can we ask you for a prayer and a blessing? Certainly. So, folks, as we prayed the gospel from the fifth Sunday of Lent, so we will pray the prayer. Please just know that in this time of great uncertainty, Know that we will live stream Palm Sunday and all the liturgies of Holy Week next week. I will be with you, obviously, in prayer and thought. Thank you, especially, for supporting me and all of our priests who are serving you so well. And let's support one another in prayer that as a Catholic community, we might care for the most needy, especially those who are ill and affected in such negative ways by this coronavirus. Let us pray. By your help, we beseech you, Lord our God, may we walk eagerly in that same charity with which out of love for the world, your son handed himself over to death. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, folks, for all your questions. Uh, make sure you, you stop back to the Bishop's Corner and listen uh, some more and send your questions in. Bishop Thomas, thank you so much. Thank you. And thanks, folks. Please tune in again and be with us on the Bishop's Corner. <laughs>